what is your relationship to death look like Hmm. now? I think in many ways, what began in childhood as a fear and also a morbid curiosity of death, Mm. right? I would, uh, uh, this this sounds quite morbid, but as a as a four year old, I would watch the scene where Bambi's mother gets shot over and over and over again, just trying to understand this thing, and was really drawn to it, and was also incredibly fearful of it, and so I had this really a lot of tension in that relationship, and I think that this isn't uncommon. We don't see death in our culture in the way that we might have when we were hunting food, we would have Mm -hmm. had a consistent view of death and death would have been too a part of our community. It wouldn't have been hidden in hospice or in hospitals. It would have been a fact we would have cared for and undertaken our dead and actually did up until about 150 years ago. And so we've really obfuscated and removed death. And I think that you even see this in our ideas of our economic system, in the idea of our resources on earth, that there is growth in perpetuity, that there is unlimited amounts. And and that speaks to a culture that has forgotten about the importance of death and decay as part of the cycle. And so I think that a lot of us have this tense relationship with death. And it's something that I really went into, I think, in those, especially in those early years of switching from being a vegetarian to being a butcher, I wanted to see my food die. And and maybe that sounds kind of harsh and kind of morbid, but I felt that to participate in this system. And I am unequivocally a participator. I am not an observer. And I am participating whether I am doing so actively or not, even if it is passive participation, that I wanted to be able to hold that piece of seeing death. And I think that that deepened over the years into wanting to be the one that brought that death to the animal and to explore my own relationship with that descent and with that facing of my own mortality, my own fears for the ways that that death is grief, that death is loss, and that it also speaks of the deep love and joy that we are capable of cultivating. And the more I go into this work, the more that's what I find that, you know, I, there's, a, there's a William Blake poem and, and, you know, joy and grief are woven together in this silk and twine, right? We need, we need both that our, our, our grief for loss speaks to the depth of the love that we are capable of. And this has continued for me to explore on the podcast. We just explored home funerals. Um, we're going to be exploring more avenues of, of what it means to grieve both for, for death, but also death of parts of ourselves or death of biodiversity in the sixth mass extinction event. And, and to really touch that because I think that we're all experiencing a sort of hollowness or an emptiness that we can't put our finger on. And I think oftentimes that thing is grief. Yeah. Yeah. You spoke to how anciently our ancestors took care of the dead. Yeah. And can you speak to that a little bit more? Is that like Mm. funerals in our homes? Is that what that looked like? Kind of, I was in India quite a few years ago and, you know, they would have the parade with the dead, their ancestor, Mm -hmm. you know, that had just died. They would take it through the alleyways and then to the fires along the Ganges. And there was Mm -hmm. something so ceremonial about all of it where the dead was with them for quite some time where how we, we treat the dead is quite a bit different. Um, Quite a bit different. yeah. 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 Some historical context here too, especially, and I want to speak to that this is strictly in the Western world and mostly in the United States, actually, that death is viewed differently in other places. Um, But we 
we don't really see death and death would have been a part of our communities for time immemorial, right? Like mm-hmm. we all die and, and we would have wanted to care for our dead with the utmost of care to, to wash their bodies, mm-hmm. um, to touch them, to be with them in the hours and a couple of days following their death in order to celebrate them, to form a new relationship with them, right? Like it, mm-hmm. it, death is not the end of our relationship with people. It is the beginning of a new iteration of relationship and to see them into whatever our beliefs are about the afterlife. Um, and this began to shift, especially after the civil war in the United States with the advent of embalming, we embalmed a lot of the soldiers and sent them home. And then Abraham Lincoln died and went on a tour. His embalmed body went on a tour across the United States and embalming became in vogue. And as we moved into cities, we hired undertakers and funeral homes to do the work that families had done forever, Mm. literally since the beginning of human time. We call it a living room because that's where the living gathered. But in the parlor, that is where we held wakes for our dead. And the undertaker generally would maybe just provide you with a coffin and you did all the other work that we now associate with undertaking. And so this, this has been a connection throughout all all of human history. And we find these burial sites and can imagine some of the rituals that went with them, right? That you uh, that you so yeah. beautifully spoke of, that there would have been these rituals to ease their passing into whatever comes next and to ease our grief into that transformation and to provide us a space for community to come together and to hold one another in that space of grief. And and now we have something that has been greatly divorced from, I think, both ritual and that connection. Um, yeah. there's a, there's a beautiful film called in the Par- parlor with, uh, Heidi Boucher, who's been on my podcast as well. She's a home funeral arranger and, you know, and it is a lot of different ways that we can begin to take that back. And I think that there's this idea that we can't have our dead in our homes. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's actually not true. Like you can still throw a wake, you can wash the body, you can build a coffin, uh, you can transport bodies yourself. And this might all sound very morbid or uh, might have some reactivity around it. And I, I do want to leave an invitation here that that's, that's totally okay. That I mm-hmm. think that that is a perfectly normal response um, on hearing this. It's something that we don't even think about. And when you were speaking to that, I remember when I was probably about 15, I grew up in a small town, very far North Canada, that was surrounded by reservations. So a lot of Indigenous people and one of our Indigenous friends died tragically and they had his coffin in their home in this Indigenous land for probably a week before his funeral. And we all went and it was so beautiful but it's not something that we think about, or I even thought about until you were just speaking to it, you know, that it. We pass down these things intergenerationally, right? Like Mm -hmm. we pass down our traditions. And one of the things I've come to see is that they're very fragile, right? Mm -hmm. That just one generation, two generations removed from this, we have lost it completely, that it is out of sight and out of mind and out of touch. And so these are things that I think we have to hold with the utmost of preciousness and sacredness and also have to bravely go into recreating for ourselves and for future generations. Yeah. Yeah. Where do you think we go after we die? Mm. I don't know. You know, I think one of the most beautiful things that anybody ever said on the podcast was um, this woman, Tara Couture, described death as an expansion. And one of the ways that I think a lot about death is through that idea of nutrient cycling that we've kind of talked about and touched on in this podcast that you have these rocks that are, you know, flung forth from this indescribable universal event. 
um, and all of the elements that make up our bodies come forth in that moment. And then fungi liberate those minerals and put them into plants that animals then eat, that then become a part of us. And we are a part of all of these different cycles and beings that have been throughout time and just the matter that makes up our bodies. And then we die and that matter returns to these deep geological and universal and I think sort of spiritual cycles. And so we are just borrowed matter on borrowed time. And so I think that it is an expansion in that what we perceive as one, right? One autopoetic system, this this boundary of, of self-creation that, that we are capable of when we are alive, when that ceases, we really return to the many, that all of the microbes that outnumber our own cells 10 to 1 uh, begin to consume us where they supported us. And all of those minerals and elements that make up our bodies return to the soil, return to plant life, return to animal life. And I think that even if it's just that, and I'm not sure that it is just that, that, that even that would be a beautiful thing. And that feels certain and tangible to me. Yeah. Yeah. And there's something deep in the unknown yeah. as well that will never fully know until yeah. we know. Yeah. yeah. Until we yeah. know. And I think that that to hold that unknown mystery, mm. Mm, I think that that's a juicy part of life. <laughs> 